Heart Baptist Church and welcome to our weekly Bible study. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would guide and direct us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So, once again, continuing with our ongoing series called Understanding the Jews. Uh, the title for tonight's lesson is Samson and Childbearing Part Three, and this is now lesson number 68 in our series and last week uh, we were in our second lesson uh, talking about the birth of Samson and the many implications of his being born to a mother who had previously been barren and unable to have children and we have discussed how <clears throat> God used circumstances such as that uh, to glorify himself whenever a miraculous birth brought forth a child who would become uh, a great servant of the Lord. We also were discussing times when God inflicted barrenness on both individual women and small groups of women. But when we ended last week, uh, we were in the midst of studying through the curse of barrenness that God proclaimed not just on one woman or even a small group of women, but, but on an entire, an entire tribe of people, the tribe of Ephraim. And we were trying to understand the reason why God did that. And that's when we had to end for the night. So the context of that incident was at the point in history when the nation of Israel had been split into two kingdoms, north and south. And the new king in the north, King Jeroboam, was worried that if his people continued to make that trip down to Jerusalem, uh, an area which was led by a different king, the people were going to change their loyalties and he would lose his kingdom. So, in order to protect himself, Jeroboam set up competing places of worship in Ephraim and Dan. And I added at the end of the lesson that he was pretty crafty in choosing those two locations. And tonight, we wanted to see why that was so. And for that, I want to return to a map that we have used before on several occasions uh, we've labeled it exhibit nine called the promised land by tribe and you will see on this map uh, that judah is the large area it should be bluish color on the map if you're looking at it uh, that's the large area comprising the bulk of the southern kingdom and along with benjamin it would form the entire border between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The map also shows that the tribe of Ephraim and Dan, which is like the pinkish and orangish color up there, those are the tribes that shared almost the entirety of the border with Judah and Benjamin. So, where did we say that Jeroboam placed these new worship centers? Oh, yes, that would be Ephraim and Dan. Now, given that location, almost everyone in the northern kingdom who would be making that pilgrimage down to the city of Jerusalem would have to pass through either Dan or Ephraim to get there. Surely, Jeroboam reasoned that if such travelers saw their fellow citizens of the northern kingdom worshiping in these new northern sites, which were located within their own country, they would be greatly persuaded to join in with their brothers in the north. And we know that was the case, because Jeroboam's plan worked. The Jews in the north stopped coming. To Jerusalem. And thus, Jeroboam no longer had to worry about 
losing the loyalty of his constituents to the king of Judah, and of course, not losing his own head in the process. Now, from the verse that we read in Hosea last week, we saw that Hosea was really placing the bulk of the blame for this circumstance on Ephraim. And that blame must be owed to two things. First, it was Ephraim that shared the longest border with Judah and would therefore have contact with the greatest number of pilgrims. And second, that there always has to be somebody who decides to go first. The first to turn his back on God and the first to agree with Jeroboam's ungodly commandment. And listen, once Ephraim was on board, all the rest of the northern kingdom fell like dominoes. Bump, bump, bump. That's why the sin of Ephraim was counted more despicable than was the sin of the others who were influenced by Ephraim and who then followed after Ephraim's example. That circumstance and that principle is biblical. And it was stated clearly by our Lord Jesus during his earthly ministry. And we're going to review exactly what Jesus said about that, but just a little bit later. But there is a very sober warning here. And it applies to anyone in any capacity or occupation including most especially those in the ministry. Namely, you can use your powers of influence uh, and persuasion for good or evil. If you choose evil, you will be putting yourself in the hands of an angry God. The price you pay will be higher and greater than the person whom you led astray. So, I'm not saying I have the absolute precision here that's necessary in detailing the way in which Ephraim was guilty of violating this principle. It's possible that there's even more to it than what I've shared with you already. But, Hosea makes it clear However it was accomplished, the Ephraimites were, in fact, guilty. They liked Jeroboam's new commandment. After all, well, he put one of their new worship centers in their own territory, and they willingly embraced it. They were not forced into it, and somehow, some way, they encouraged the other northern tribes to do likewise. And accordingly, oh, and here's where the punishment comes in. The great fertility that Ephraim had enjoyed for many years was no longer going to be a source of pride and glory. Childbearing was now going to become difficult, painful, and fraught with untold problems. In essence, their prolific childbearing, which they were known for, was going to come under a curse, the curse of God. And as part of that curse, many Ephraimite women would become barren. So clearly, barrenness is sometimes the result of a curse from God. But, before any woman out there uh, who may be watching this thinks that their personal inability to have a child is a curse, I want to belay that notion. Barrenness is not always a curse. In fact, sometimes it's a blessing. It's been so in the past and it will be so again in the future. The scripture makes it clear 
that barrenness is not always a curse or a judgment for sin. Sometimes it is existence so that God can exhibit his power and thus be glorified. And at other times, it happens because it's better that a child not be born into a situation and circumstance present at that particular time. And I want to look at some examples that we can find in the scriptures. There seems to be no better place to start than with the matriarchs and prophets of the Old Testament. And before we do that, it should be understood, and I hope it's understood by now, that all women are in fact barren until God opens the womb. Now, we're going to see that some women were barren for a period of time, but afterwards, at a later time, sometimes a much later time, did eventually have children. But others never did. Abraham's wife, Sarah, was barren for almost the entirety of her life. But it was no curse. Because when she was in her 90s, she had Isaac, the glory of God. A child of promise, without whom there would be no Israel. Let's take a look in Genesis chapter 11. I want to look at two verses, 29 and 30. The scripture reads, And Abraham and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. In the next chapter, I'm sorry, 10 chapters later, in verse chapter 21, verses 1 through 3, we read this. And the Lord visited Sarah, her name had changed by then, as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. Next, I want to look at Rebekah. When Rebekah married Isaac, the son we just talked about here, she was barren for the first 20 years of their marriage. But both Isaac and Rebekah prayed unto God, and God opened Rebekah's womb, and she gave birth to twins, Esau and Jacob, two great patriarchs that our pastor Johnson just preached about recently. So let's look at Genesis 25 for that, starting with verse 21. The scripture reads, And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And let's skip down to verses 25 through 26. The scripture reads, And the first came out red all over like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel. And his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when he bare them. So, as you can see, as we read in the scriptures, Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, but it wasn't until he was 60 that she gave him his sons. Clearly, that long period of barrenness was to emphasize both the sovereignty of God and the unique the unique place that these two children were going to have. And then we have the wife of one of those two sons, one of those twins, Jacob. Jacob's wife, Rachel. She watched as Jacob's 
other wives were giving him children while she could not. And at the first, out of frustration, Rachel wanted to blame her husband Jacob for her barrenness. But, upon reflection, both she and Jacob knew that only God could remedy the situation. So again, we find that they both prayed unto God, and when the time was right, Rachel bore two children. So let's look in Genesis 29 and verse 31. The scripture reads, And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. But let's move to chapter 30, verses 1 and 2. The scripture reads, And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister, and said unto Jacob, Give me children, or else I die. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. And he said, Am I in God's stead? Who hath withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? So there's an, a long interval here, really of some undetermined length. An interval between the time that Jacob first married Rachel's sister Leah and when Rachel finally gave Jacob a son. But we do know that it was pretty long. Uh, we know that because Rachel didn't bear any children <clears throat> until after Jacob's other wife, Leah, and two of his concubines had already given him ten sons. It wasn't until then that God was pleased to remember Rachel. Let's go to Genesis 30, verses 22 through 24. The scripture reads, And God remembered Rachel. And God hearkened to her, and opened her womb. And she conceived and bare a son, and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. So Rachel at long last had two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. Once again, we find that those two sons were to hold a prominent position, prominent position in Israel. It would be Joseph who would be the savior of Israel, the one who would preserve his father Jacob's household during a time of great famine, a time when the providence of God had made Joseph a leader in Egypt. A man who had stewardship over all of Pharaoh's food supplies. That was no coincidence. And what do we owe to Benjamin? Well, we owe to him most of the New Testament. It was the Apostle Paul, a descendant of Benjamin, who would write the majority of those precious books. So Rachel's weight was long, but the wait was worth it. What seemed to be a curse was eventually found out to be a blessing. Her acknowledgement of God's gift of children was to the glory of God, and it was a blessing to us. Now, of course, we know that Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin. The reason for her death is uncertain. <clears throat> but it is surely ironic that in the passage we read, <clears throat> excuse me, in Genesis 30, verse 1, Rachel said if Jacob didn't give her children, she would die, only to end up dying in the act of having a child. And then we have the case that we are now studying. The wife of Manoah who would give birth to Samson. We don't even know her name. It's not given to us in the Bible. But we know that she was not able to bear children for a long time, long enough to be called barren. But again, God touched her barrenness 
and she bore Samson, who would begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. Now, I'm not going to take you to those scriptures right now because we're going to return to the account of Samson after this intervening discussion that we're having about barrenness. But by now, I think you're starting to see the pattern that I was talking about earlier. But I want to touch on just two more examples, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. And then I want to look at yet one more aspect of barrenness. One that is in a different category from the ones we're considering right now. So let's first turn to the woman in the Old Testament named Hannah. For that, we'll go to 1 Samuel chapter 1, and this will be verses 1 through 11. The scripture reads, Now there was a certain man, Vermathium Zophim, of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept, and did not eat. Then said Elkanah her husband to her, Hannah, why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not, and why is thy heart grieved? And not I better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed <clears throat> unto the Lord, and wept sore. And listen, and she vowed a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look upon the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Now, once again, we see a woman under great stress because she had no child. And she prayed fervently unto God for him to intercede. In fact, her prayer and her grief was such that the priest of the temple where she was praying, Eli, thought she was drunk. But God would turn her situation around when she conceived and bore the great Samuel, a man who would anoint the first king of Israel. And lastly, now I want to go to the New Testament and befitting the season that we're in, Christmas, uh, we have Elizabeth. So let's go to the uh, Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. The scripture reads, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, 
walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. So we see at least two things here, I think, that are relevant. First, we see that Elizabeth was well stricken in years, meaning that she was beyond her childbearing years. There would be no other reason to highlight how old she was. And the same goes for her husband, Zacharias. Secondly, well, apart from perhaps Enoch, uh, their personal righteousness was described in about as favorable a way as you will find in the Bible. In fact, the term that's used is righteous and blameless. How can that be? How can they be called righteous? We know that our own righteousness is as filthy rags before God. Amen? And that is true. So we must see their righteousness in the context and meaning of the description given. The scripture says that the way in which they walked after the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, they were seen as blameless. What does that mean? We know that only Christ was sinless. So we cannot take from this passage that Zacharias and Elizabeth were sinless. They were not sinless. But in the eyes of their contemporaries, they were blameless. No one among the Jews could charge them with not following after the will of God in all things. They were really among the best that the Jews had to offer, such as it were. Whenever they failed, they repented. They redoubled their efforts to get back into God's good graces. They respected and believed the commandments, and they purposed, at least, to keep all of the ordinances of God. One of which was the Levitical sacrificial system. And by this description that we see in Luke 1, 6, it is certain that they understood the Passover sacrifice as pointing to the Messiah. Their faith was not in a political Messiah, but in the true Messiah, the Christ of God. And hence, their righteousness was not their own, but his, as is the case for every true believer throughout all the ages. So having been given this glowing description of Elizabeth and Zacharias, uh, we really can't in any way understand her barrenness as being some kind of a curse from God. It doesn't fit. Uh, her failure to produce a child was clearly for a different reason. Let's go to Luke chapter 1 and verse 13. Scripture reads, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. So now, right here, we find the reason for the barrenness of Elizabeth. Her miraculous conception was used to the glory of God because her son John, born in such a remarkable way, would be the one who would finally announce the arrival of Jesus Christ, the Savior. And Jesus said that in his eyes, Jesus' eyes, 
There had never been a man born to woman that was greater than John. A man born to parents who were both supposedly too old to have children. I think by now the pattern has been well established. Not that God used this method in every case, because he didn't. But it's just as clear that oftentimes women who were barren were used of God to bring glory to his name by interceding in that barrenness and producing a child of great consequence. To say that their barrenness was a curse would have been proven dramatically wrong. Now, before you call to me, call me to account, <laughs> I will state the obvious. All of these women that we have discussed <clears throat> eventually did have children. So their barrenness was temporary. They were not truly barren, at least not in the fullest sense. That is technically true. But absent the clear intervention of God, their long-standing condition of barrenness would not have changed. So, <clears throat> we have seen in the scriptures that barrenness may or may not be a curse from God. It is totally dependent on the purposes of God. But what about the other side of coin? Are there times when barrenness is actually a blessing? Now this time I'm not talking about temporary barrenness, the kind we've just discussed. I'm now talking about a permanent condition. No children. Now the Old Testament culture, <clears throat> and to an extent I would say even today's culture, puts a fair amount of pressure and a lot of expectations on women. Well, you must get married. Uh, you must have children. And if you don't, well, something must be wrong, right? You must have sin in your life. Unfortunately, women do experience such treatment. Uh, but it is very unfair. Listen. Barrenness does not usually have anything to do with one's relationship with God. Or one's personal walk in the faith, for that matter. We need to set those notions aside. And understand what the Bible actually says. There are times when barrenness is actually for the better. And I only know that because the scripture tells me so. Let's start with a verse in Isaiah. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 54, very first verse. Scripture reads, Sing, O barren, that thou didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud. Thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Now it's tempting, I guess, and I could just take this verse and run with it and say, Ah, there it is. A woman who's barren should sing for joy. <clears throat> and somehow make us think that that's what this verse is all about. Not quite. Part of the message, <clears throat> and in one sense, there is some truth in it. But in the opinion of most Bible scholars, there is a context that should not be missed. And we find it in the second half of that verse. We read it. It says, quote, More are the children of the desolate than the married wife. That phrase modifies and informs the first half of the verse that talks about those women singing. What question needs to be answered? The question is, why would barren women be singing? Under what circumstances would that be so? Well, 
It certainly wouldn't have been a general application, and it doesn't have a general application. But it does have a specific one, one that was experienced in the Old Testament. And I will mention that our Lord Jesus talked about three other exceptions in the New Testament. But again, as I said, I will get to those down the road just a little bit later. But first, let's talk about the desolate who will have more children than the married wife. When you talk about the desolate or the desolation of Israel, what are we talking about? And what would be the connection with the subject at hand? Namely, a woman's preference for barrenness. Well, time prevents me from getting into that right now. But, Lord willing, we will start with that question next week. So until then, please remember to pray for all those on our prayer list. Until we meet again, Shalom.